O come, O come, thou living word, and pierce our hearts with healing sword. From God's own mouth proceeding far to lance the festering wounds of war. Rejoice, rejoice, to mend our strife shall come in flesh the God of life. A poem by Jim Cotter from Expectant Verses for Advent. Welcome to Advent. Advent is a time for waiting, preparing, expecting with anticipation God's presence. It is a time to see God's presence expressed in a new way in order to change our present situation. And I am most certainly including our own present personal situation. The readings for today from Isaiah, from the Psalmist, Paul's letter to the Corinthians, and the Gospel of Mark are fantastic readings for this first day of Advent. Isaiah and Mark may seem frightening and gloomy, but in reality, they are. <laughs> <laughs> Isaiah's lament is beautiful and instills a soulfulness of one left out of God's sight. Mark's, Mark's apocalyptic passage is one that I have difficulty with. I have a difficult time of understanding it, and so do many scholars. It doesn't, on first read, it doesn't appear to be too comforting. And some of our brothers and sisters and their more fundamentalist leanings have made it their own and combined it with other passages, non-related passages, and sometimes spout it with a smug sweetness as if they have nothing to worry about. But I do. By cutting through these perceptions and wrestling with the verse, it actually does does contain words of hope for the now and for the future. This passage from Isaiah was written during the exile of the Israelites in Babylon. The temple had been destroyed by King Nebuchadnezzar. And many of the Israelites, especially the leaders, the elite, the academics, the priests, had been placed in exile in Babylon. And many had been left behind to fend for themselves, ruled by a distant foreign king. This exile and the rule of Babylon over Israel lasted for a generation. No wonder Isaiah's lament is so soulful. God does appear to have abandoned them. But the writer reminds God of who the Israelites are and reminds God of their relationship with God. In the Gospel of Mark today, we heard a pericope taken from what many describe as Mark's little apocalypse. Mark's Jesus is talking of eschatology, the theological beliefs and descriptions of the final events of history, the end time. In this little apocalypse, it appears that there is an imminent and a future apocalypse, the complete and final destruction of the world. How can that be? Well, remember the destruction again of the temple in 70 AD by the Romans was well, surely an apocalyptic event of which the Markan community was well aware. And that was certainly a reason for the statement in those days after the suffering and the call to keep awake. I give you this. If we're talking of the end of the world as we know it, not the R.E.M. song, but the end that began 2,000 years ago, not with a conquering Superman speeding through the sky, but as a powerless baby, a powerless God, capable not of might and power in physical terms, but in terms of an all-powerful 
powerful love from God. <clears throat> Here we are, now with that divine intervention, still taking shape through us, the church. And it isn't easy. Many of us wish the divine Superman would descend from the skies and take care of all that is wrong, mainly the other people that we perceive as threats. Are we waiting with and preparing with anticipatory fervor for the end of the world as we know it? Or are we just hunkering down, awaiting God to come down and fix it all? Maybe our complacency has removed God from the picture altogether. And I suspect for many it has. Last week in the information released on the investigation of Officer Darren Wilson, the Ferguson, Missouri officer who killed Michael Brown, an 18-year-old black man, Officer Wilson stated, the only option I thought I had was my gun. And I can certainly understand that. Someone's going to remove your gun. It's not because they want to try to scare you. With it. But Officer Wilson, Officer Wilson, I believe, speaks for all of us when he made that comment. When we lay in the fetal position in fear and curse at the way things are, I don't blame Officer Wilson for what happened, nor do I blame Michael Brown for what transpired that day. I blame us all, all of us. For this lament in which God is totally removed from the equation by us, the people who say we want better, is that our lament? I have no doubt that Michael Brown probably thought that day that he only had one option, the gun on the officer. With the stand your ground laws and the guns everywhere bill, it is obvious to me, to me, I think, from my position, that we do think the only option we have is our guns. Guns as used in making everything all right again, are a symbol of our fear that God has abandoned us. Now let me say that when we are at the point in our personal lives and in our corporate lives that the only option we think we have is our gun, that the only option we have, that we think we have, is the nuclear option against all we perceive as threats to us, both real and imagined, then we are not keeping awake, as Mark tells us to. We're doing the opposite. We are not anticipating the joy of God's kingdom fully upon this earth, in His coming upon earth, and in our hearts. What we are doing is placing our faith in ourselves and saying to God, you, the potter, have misused the clay. Instead of a Markham theological eschatology of dread and hope, it is only dread that we can now believe in. We have no interest in fresh possibilities of the coming of Christ be it the first time or the second time. And by fresh possibilities, I mean what Walter Brueggemann said, a spirit of yearning for that which would be too good to be true, some new and unique expression of God's intention to save a world gone wrong. And I use that for our personal lives as well. Do we not think that God can do something too good to be true in our lives, to save us from our lives, our living, in which something has gone terribly wrong. 
when our only option we believe we have is total violence to eradicate the other, then the need of the first 2,000 years ago of vulnerability and need and care by others and for others disappears. It fades away in our hearts, and we can no longer see God's face, Christ's face, in anyone. But God in Christ has not disappeared. And Isaiah's cry to see God's face again and to make it all full of fresh beginnings becomes more meaningful to us when we are vulnerable and admit our need. Paul reminds us that for Christ's reign now and when Christ returns, we have the spiritual gifts to be prepared for this union of God and God's creation. Things will never be the same again for the world because of Jesus Christ's first advent and because of his impending second advent, however that may happen. Things will never be the same again because of Christ's promise to us of making a new creation in us and through us, the church. Do not fear. Do not limit your options to that of striking before being struck. Limit your option only to the love of God because God's love will win. And heed the words of Christ and stay awake. Be vigilant so that we may be delivered out of exile into the promise of God. O come, O come, thou wisdom strange from deep within God's womb to range the earth at midnight's hour of fears to make us wise beyond our years. Rejoice, rejoice, our God shall leave with light that rouses us from sleep. Um. Amen. Amen.